A Patriot's History of the United States, Chapter 6, Part 4, The Restless Spirit. From the outset, America had been a nation of entrepreneurs, a country populated by restless souls. No sooner had settlers arrived along the port cities than they spread inland, and after they had constructed the first inland forts, trappers and explorers pressed farther into the forests and mountains. The restless spirit and dynamic entrepreneurship fed off each other, the former producing a constant itch to improve and invent, the latter demanding better ways of meeting people's needs, of organizing better systems of distribution and supply, and of adding to the yearning for still more and improved products. In a society where most people still work the land, this incessant activity worked itself out in the relationship with the land. Cutting, clearing, building, irrigating, herding, hunting, lighting, and fighting fires, and populating. Unlike Europeans, however, Americans benefited from a constantly expanding supply of property they could possess and occupy. Unlike Europeans, Americans often never saw themselves as permanently fixed to a location. Alexis de Tocqueville, the observant French visitor, remarked, An American will build a house in which to pass his old age and sell it before the roof is on. He will plant a garden and rent it just as the trees are coming into bearing. He will clear a field and leave others to reap the harvest. He will take up a profession and leave it settle in one place, and soon go off elsewhere with his changing desires. If his private business allows him a moment's relaxation, he will plunge at once into the whirlpool of politics. To some degree, money, or lack of it, dictated constant churning. The same desire to experience material abundance drove men and women to perpetually invent and design, innovate and imagine. The motivations for moving, though, were as diverse as the country itself. For every Daniel Boone or Davy Crockett who constantly relocated out of land fever, there was a Gail Borden, a New York farm boy who wound up in Galveston, Texas, where he invented the Terrapin Wagon, a completely amphibious vehicle before returning to New York to invent his famous condensed milk process. In the same vein, Vermonter John Deere, who moved his farm implement business steadily westward, developed the finest farm implements in the world, epitomizing the restless frontier spirit observed by Tocqueville. This restless generation produced a group of entrepreneurs unparalleled in American history, including Andrew Carnegie, born 1835, J.P. Morgan, 1837, John D. Rockefeller, 1839, and Levi Strauss, 1829. Most came from lower to middle class backgrounds. Carnegie arrived in America virtually penniless, and Strauss worked his way up with a small mercantile store. They typified what a Cincinnati newspaper stated of this generation. There is not one who does not desire, even confidently expect, to become rich. Yet the lure of the land had its own dark side, turning otherwise honorable men into scalawags and foragers. Jim Bowie, who would die at the Alamo with Davy Crockett in 1836, surpassed everyone with his ingenuity in developing fraudulent land grants. One writer noted that whereas Bowie was hardly alone in forging grants, he worked on an almost industrial scale compared to others. Through a labyrinth of forged documents, Bowie managed to make himself one of the largest landowners in Louisiana, garnering a total holding of 45,700 acres. An official smelled the rat, but Bowie managed to extract all the suspicious documents before they landed him in jail. Land attracted small farmers to Indiana, then Illinois, then on to Minnesota and Wisconsin. Assuming that the minimal amount of land for self-sufficiency was 40 to 50 acres, it took only a few generations before a father would not bequeath to his son enough land to make a living, 
forcing countless American young men and their families westward. Southern legal traditions with vestigial primogeniture, or the custom of bequeathing the entire estate to the eldest son, resulted in fewer landholders and a smaller population, but much larger estates. Men like Bowie thus dealt not only in land, but also in slaves needed to run the plantations. Whether it was the Yazoo in Mississippi or the forested sections of Michigan, land hunger drew Americans steadily westward. Abundant land and scarce labor meant that even in agriculture, farmer businessmen substituted new technology for labor with every opportunity. Handmade hoes, shovels, rakes, and the like soon gave way to James Wood's metal plow, whose interchangeable parts made for easy repair. This and other designs were mass-produced by entrepreneurs like Charles Lane of Chicago, so that by the 1830s, metal plows were commonplace. Pittsburgh had two factories making 34,000 metal plows a year, even in the 1830s. And by 1845, Massachusetts had 73 plow manufacturing firms, turning out more than 60,000 farm implements a year. No more important, but certainly more celebrated, the famous McCormick Reaper, perfected by Cyrus McCormick, opened up the vast prairies to agribusiness. McCormick began on the East Coast, but relocated to Chicago to be closer to the land boom. After fashioning his first reaper in 1834, he pumped up production until his factory churned out 4,000 reapers annually. In an 1855 exposition in Paris, McCormick stunned Europeans by harvesting an acre of oats in 21 minutes, or one-third of the time taken by Continental Machines. If land provided the allure for most of those who moved to the Mississippi and beyond, a growing but important substrata of mechanics, artisans, inventors, salesmen, and merchants soon followed, adapting their businesses to the new frontier demands. No one captured the restless inventive spirit better than Eli Whitney. After working on his father's farm in Connecticut, Whitney enrolled in and graduated from Yale. There he met Phineas Miller, who managed some South Carolina properties for Catherine Green, and Miller invited the young Whitney to take a position as a tutor to the Green children on a plantation. His cotton gin, in retrospect a remarkably simple device, shook the world, causing an explosion in textile production. In 1810, 119 pounds of cotton per day could be cleaned, and by 1860, that number had risen to 759 per day. Mrs. Green soon came to say of Whitney, he can make anything. Indeed, he could. Whitney soon tried his hand at musket production using a largely unskilled workforce. What emerged was the American system of manufacturing, which served as the basis for a powerful system. Advances in mass production, steam power, and management techniques coalesced in the textile mills founded in New England by Samuel Slater, a British immigrant. Slater built a small mill in Rhode Island with the support of Moses Brown, a Providence candle manufacturer, first using water wheels, then replacing water with steam power. Within 20 years, Slater and his close circle of associates had 9,500 spindles and controlled nearly half of all American spinning mills. Brown even wrote to his children that the mill founders had cotton mill fever. Francis Cabot Lowell exceeded even Slater's achievements in textile production, employing young girls who lived on site. Lowell further advanced the organizational gain made by Whitney and Slater. Gains in manufacturing resulted in part from widespread application of steam power. Steam revolutionized transportation with Robert Fulton's Claremont demonstrating steam propulsion on water in 1807. Within a decade, Cornelius Vanderbilt began using steam technology to cut costs in the New York, New Jersey ferry traffic, and steam power started to find its way to inland waterways. 
entrepreneurs had already started to shift the focus of water travel in the interior from natural rivers to man-made canals. The period from 1817 to 1844 has been referred to as the Canal Era, in which some 4,000 miles of canals were constructed at a cost of $200 million. States collaborated with the private interests in many of these projects, usually by guaranteeing state bond issues in case of default. But some of the earliest and best were built by private businesses, such as the Middlesex Canal in Massachusetts and the Santee and Cooper Canal in South Carolina. The most famous, the Erie Canal, linked the Hudson River and Lake Erie and opened up the upstate New York markets to the coast. Unlike some of the other early privately financed canals, the Erie was built at a state expense over an eight-year period, and its competition was so anticipated that the state collected and advanced $1 million in tolls before the canal was even opened. It was a massive engineering feat. The canal was 40 feet wide, 4 feet deep, and 363 miles long all bordered by towpaths to allow draft animals to pull barges and flatboats. 86 locks were used to raise and lower boats 565 feet. When the Erie opened in 1825, it earned 8% of its $9 million from the 3,000 boats traversing the canal. After the Board of Commissioners approved enlarging the canal in 1850, it reached its peak tonnage in 1880. Steam power soon replaced animal power on all the nation's waterways. Well before steam power was common, however, canals had driven down the costs of shipping from 20 cents per ton mile to a tenth of that amount, and even a noted financial failure like the Ohio Canal yielded a respectable 10% social rate of return. Steam vessels on the Great Lakes, where ships occasionally exceeded 1,000 tons, and in the case of the city of Buffalo, displaced a whopping 2,200 tons, also played an important role. By mid-century, the tonnage on the Mississippi River and on the Great Lakes exceeded that of all shipping from New York City by over 200%. The canal era provided the first model of state government support of large-scale enterprise through bond guarantees, often with disastrous results. In the Panic of 1837, Many states were pushed to the brink of bankruptcy by their canal bond obligations. Steam also reduced shipping costs for oceanic travel, where again Cornelius Vanderbilt emerged as a key player. Facing a competitor who received sizable federal mail subsidies, Vanderbilt nevertheless drove down his own transatlantic costs to the point where he consistently outperformed his government-supported opponent. Having won on the Hudson, then on the Atlantic, Vanderbilt next struck on the Pacific coast, breaking into the subsidized packet steamer trade. Vanderbilt's competition received $500,000 in federal subsidies and charged a staggering $600 per passenger ticket for a New York to California trip via Panama, where the passengers had to disembark and travel overland to board another vessel. After constructing his own route through Nicaragua rather than Panama, Vanderbilt chopped passenger prices to $400 and offered to carry the mail free. Within a year, thanks to the presence of Vanderbilt, fares dropped to $150, then $100. As occurred in the Hudson competition, the Commodore's competitors finally bought his routes, but even then they found they could never return to the high ticket prices they had charged before he drove costs down. When Vanderbilt left the packet steamer business, a ticket cost just half what could be fleeced from passengers in the pre-Vanderbilt era. Steam technology also provided the basis for another booming American industry when Philip Thomas led a group of Baltimore businessmen to found the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad in 1828. Two years later, the South Carolina Canal and Railroad Company began a steam locomotive train service westward from Charleston, with its locomotive, best friend of Charleston, being the first constructed for sale in the United States. The king of American locomotive building was Matthias Baldwin, who made his first locomotive in 1832 and founded 
the Baldwin Engine and Locomotive Works. His firm turned out more than 1,500 locomotives during his lifetime, including many for export. Within a few years, contemporaries were referring to railroad building as a fever, a frenzy, and a mania. There were enormous positive social consequences of better transportation. By linking Orange County, New York, the leading dairy county, to New York City, the railroad contributed to the reduction of milk-borne diseases like cholera by supplying fresh milk. By 1840, most states had railroads, although the Atlantic seaboard states had more than 60% of total railroad mileage. Like the canals, many railroads received state backing. Some were constructed by individual entrepreneurs, but the high capital demands of the railroads, combined with the public's desire to link up every burg by rail, led to states taking a growing role in the financing of American railroads. Railroad size and scope of operations required huge amounts of capital compared to textile mills or ironworks. This dynamic forced them to adopt a new structure in which the multiple stockholder owners selected a professional manager to run the firm. By the 1840s, banks and railroads were inexorably linked, not only through the generation of capital, but also through the new layer of professional managers many of them put in place by the banks that own the majority stock positions. As transportation improved, communication networks also proliferated. Banks could evaluate the quality of private banknote issues through Dilliston's Banknote Reporter, which was widely circulated. The Cincinnati-based Bradstreet Company provided similar evaluation of businesses themselves. Investor knowledge benefited from the expansion of the U.S. Post Office, which had over 18,000 branches by 1850, one for every 1,300 people. Congress had a direct stake in the Post Office in that congressional apportionment was based on population, and since constituents clamored for new routes, there was a built-in bias in favor of expanding the postal network. Most routes did not even bear more than 1% of their cost, but that was irrelevant given the political gains they represented. In addition to their value in apportionment, the postal branches offered legislatures a free election tool. Congressmen shipped speeches and other election materials to constituents free, thanks to the franking privileges. Partisan concerns also linked post office branches and the party controlled newspapers by reducing the cost of distribution through the mails. From 1800 to 1840, the number of newspapers transmitted through the mails rose from 2 million to almost 140 million at far cheaper rates than other printed material. Postal historian Richard John estimated that if the newspapers had paid the same rate as other mails, the transmission costs would have been 700 times greater. The new party system by 1840 had thus compromised the independence of the mails and a large part of the printed media with no small consequences. Among other defects, the subsidies created incentives to read newspapers rather than books. This democratization of the news produced a population of people who thought they knew a great deal about current events, but who lacked the theoretical grounding in history, philosophy, or politics to properly ground their opinions. As the number of U.S. post office branches increased, the post office itself came to wield considerable clout and the position of postmaster became a political plum. The postmaster general alone controlled more than 8,700 jobs, more than three-fourths of the federal civilian workforce, larger even than the army. Patronage explained the ability of companies receiving federal subsidies to repel challenges from the private sector, allowing the subsidized postal companies to defeat several private expresses in the 1830s. The remarkable thing about the competition to the subsidized mails was not that it lasted so long and did not resurface until Fred Smith founded Federal Express in 1971, but that it even appeared in the first place. 
and we'll go on with setting the table for growth in the next video. Please click like, subscribe to the channel, and leave a comment below. I'd love to hear from you. I love you guys. As Tigger says, ta-ta for now.